got the grant and they asked me to help them, but trying to get a company like CCA to have a human rights resolution, and they did. We got them to adopt the human rights resolution to treat some of these inmates with, with dignity. We didn't get them to apply it, but we got them to adopt it. Um, so you have these two approaches, the human rights, which is an appeal to our, our sense of what's civilized, what constitutes civilized decency, which is also what the Eighth Amendment's made up of. And then on the other side, we have the empirical part. And uh, Craig Haney, who uh, does a lot of writing in the area, he did one of his meta studies. He wrote studied 50 studies that studied inmates who had done long terms. And what we mean by long-term confinement and segregation is over 30 days. That's kind of arbitrary, but it's not capricious. You know, and it's true. Um, and he said every study produced data that was more or less acceptable, empirical data, um, that the, there was extensive and, some, and very often lasting harm. A friend of mine, Terry Coopers, is writing in this area. And he just, he does a lot of work with the California inmates and, and generally everywhere. He's a psychiatrist. And he's discovered now, and he has a book coming out, it hasn't come out yet, that there is a syndrome, the, 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 um, the solitary confinement syndrome, he calls it, that is almost identical to post-traumatic stress syndrome. And the same symptoms of people who have been stressed out from, from warfare or growing up in a neighborhood that I grew up in, um, that uh, the, the, it's the same kinds of symptoms. And to the extent that that holds up, you now have two really interesting prongs. The empirical prong, there's evidence here. Um, maybe it's challengeable. Well, to the extent it's challengeable, the human rights part uh, is not challengeable except to debate the philosophy of it. So what, what do these places look like? You know, um, what, I probably should have done this much earlier. I, I have here, remember I told you about, I said Jack, I think it's Tom Silverstein. Let me, let me read the, his description of his cell. He said he's been confined now for about 30 years, quote, in a cell so small, I could stand in one place and touch both walls simultaneously. The ceiling was so low I could reach up and touch the hot light fixture. My bed took up the length of the cell and there was no other furniture. The walls were solid steel painted all white. I was allowed to wear underwear but given no other clothing. I was completely, totally isolated from the outside world. I had no way to occupy my time. I was not allowed any visits. I was not allowed any telephone privileges. No reading materials except the Bible. I did not have TV, radio, or a tape player. I could speak to no one, and there was virtually nothing on which to focus my, atten my attention. That, that's a form of, that, that's about as deep end. It's not always that deep end. Um, typically, another notch up is a cell like this, but you get out five hours a week uh, to, into, into what's called a dog run. It's a cage. And you, you can exercise by yourself and walk up and down this cage. Now, a lot of inmates won't do that um, for all kinds of reasons. They won't even go out for the five hours a week um, because your strip search going out and your strip search coming back in. And as one inmate said to me, he said, I'm not going to let those guys look at parts of my body I've never seen. Uh, and they maintained a kind of a little humor about it. I'm just not going to do it. I'm not going to give up that sh shred of decency. Uh, that I have, um, that, I, that I can hold on to. Um, the lead plaintiff in that uh, Illinois case that I was involved with, his name was Rasho. Came, a Serbian guy, uh, accountant, came into the Illinois prison system, which is bad. Came into the Illinois system as a white collar criminal and um, he, he was outspoken, you know, he was, he was a bit he, he, if you don't follow all their orders, he, I don't think he did anything violent at all, but anyway, a series of events led him to be locked up, and he was locked down for three years. He had come out by the time I met him, and during the time he was locked down and smearing his body with feces, which is an 
unbelievable thing to experience because I've never heard of it outside of prison. Never heard of it. But he also ate part of his shoulder. He, he engaged in an act of self-cannibalism. I mean, these are the worst kinds of things, it's true, but I could give you, I could give you example after example. I've seen gang leaders in Illinois prisons, guys who, you know, whatever, it may be a false kind of pride, but whatever it is, they walk the streets, they're macho, they're big guys, they're all tattooed up. And when you see them, after a year in solitary, they have smeared their bodies with feces, they're throwing bombs, they're called urine, and um, feces packed into whatever they can get them into, throwing them out. The cells smell, they're, bang they're cutting themselves up, they're screaming. Um, you walk through a segregation unit uh, where the guys have been locked down, <coughs> there's one of two things going on. It's eerily quiet. That's very often the case. No noise at all. They're all drugged up, and they're all asleep. You see a hand protrude or a foot protrude, and then you don't wake them up. You just, you just walk. You can't tell if they're getting treatment. You have to look at their records. Or it's so noisy that you, you wonder how anybody can survive. The noise is unbelievable, screaming and yelling. And especially if you're a stranger, and if, as a stranger, if they, if they know it's me, and then I'm a court monitor, they want my attention. You got to help me, you know, because they think I don't mean they're saying they're in. You got to help me. You got to get me out of this. You know? And this is not. These aren't unusual cases. I mean, they're, they're not. They're, they're, it's not utter, absolutely common. There are some people who survive it. Silverstein survived it. Uh, Rasho survived it. So I'm not saying that everybody who goes through even the deepest end comes out. You know, uh, totally destroyed and forever. But I don't know how, the, you know, I don't know his interior. I don't know what Rasho's really like, what, what kind of a person he's going to be like when he gets out. But I, I don't know that. Um, <clears throat> the, um, what's the core, what's the core right that's at stake here? And, 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 under the Constitution and hundreds of ca federal cases, Inmates have a constitutional right to minimally adequate food, shelter, uh, clothing, uh, safety, um, health care. And I think what should be added to that is minimal, minimally regulated right to socialization. Now that's based on a belief I have. I think there's data for it. That w we are social beings. And to the extent you destroy your opportunity to have to have to socialize, to, to the extent you take that's taken away, the the psyche just just be, begins to suffer greatly, suffer greatly. There are two groups that have been very, and then I'm going to take questions. Two groups that have won in the courts. The first group that brought lawsuits were juveniles. There was a case here from. Um, New York, the Lawless case in 1976, where a 15-year-old, I think, she, I think she was 15, was locked up in her room, room confinement, for two weeks. And the federal district court said that that violated her due process rights because the judge said kids experience time differently and it's very destructive for them. So there are a whole series of cases and now President Obama announced no federal system. There are very few juveniles, but you cannot, no, no, they cannot be locked down in solitary confinement. So th they've won a series of cases. But the, and it, uh, the, the second group uh, of gr that I call a group of vulnerables, people more vulnerable to the impact of, of this kind of isolation, are the mentally ill. A whole series of cases uh, have been won. Wisconsin <laughs> was one of the first in, in California. Uh, that if you are seriously mentally ill, uh, you cannot be put in solitary confinement. When I was the monitor in Ohio, we got the state to adopt a rule that no person could be transferred from a maximum security prison or uh, to, uh, to their supermax, which is a form of segregation or into, in, into segregated confinement 
Um, it was not permitted. Uh, you, you just couldn't do it. And if, and if the, a clinician said the person was psychologically vulnerable to falling apart, they couldn't be transferred in. So we managed to do it as a matter of negotiation. I was the monitor. I couldn't force them to do that. But I showed them, I thought, how they could do it and uh, why it wouldn't be difficult for them. Uh, when, we were, when we were doing this study in Illinois, Illinois had some very old prisons. They had a prison called Menard, which is in Chester, Illinois. <laughs> And the reason I remember it is because the thing that Chester, beside this prison, is most known for is the guy who drew, who drew Popeye came from there. So they have a little park in the middle of town and have olive oil and Popeye and Wimpy. So it's a high cultural place. <laughs> and, and Menard, Menard is, was built in 1870, I think. It's right on the banks of the Mississippi. The walls are like this you know, from the old days. And I went into the SEG unit, and I went into the first one, six by nine cell. Can you picture that? 54 feet? Two guys, my size, but about 100 pounds heavier. There's a toilet and um, a double bunk bed. They couldn't get by each other to get to the toilet. And um, there's no ventilation, tiniest slit of a window. And you know what it's like in Illinois. <laughs> to be on the banks of the Mississippi in the summer, you freeze in the winter and die from heat and humidity in this. And I, ple I didn't have the right to do this. We were just investigating. So I pleaded with the lawyers for the plaintiff's class. I said, let's get these guys out of here. All we have to do is open the door and put, that, put a, a couple of uh, tables out and board games. Um, this is a big, re re big reform movement. Get them out for an hour or two, and they refused to do it. Too dangerous, too dangerous. You could see down the hallway. I couldn't get the plaintiffs to ask for that. It's not. It's not only the defendants are bad guys. A lot of plaintiffs. I was a, a senior partner in a major law firm from Chicago doing pro bono work. He didn't want to unsettle things. So, um, and that case is still going on. So it's the, when you lock a person down, obviously when you're in prison, 